So are we actually live now, actually? Now live. Now live, okay. So, uh, and is everyone who's meant to be joining us remotely joined? Yeah. But just coming in now. Just coming in now. Before I start the meeting, I need to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Uh, and for the benefit of everyone who's listening, uh, what Peggy usually does is she goes around the table and everyone introduces themselves. So um, start with Ashley and come around this way if that's OK. Uh, Ashley Kendrick, committee officer. David Evans, Councillor for Chester and the Craven Hall. Roy Allcroft, uh, Councillor for Market Rate and the East Division. Peter Broomall, Man, Man Division. Uh, Ted McFarlane, Councillor for Sundor. Paula Lawson, Assistant Director for Integration and Healthy Population. Uh, Claire Wild, I'm chairing the meeting today and I'm the Councillor for Seventh Valley. Afternoon all, Tanya Mars, ED for People at Shropshire Council. Sorry, good afternoon everybody, Assistant Director for Children's Social Care and Safeguarding for Shropshire Council. Uh, Chris Goldfield, Lost Trees. That Green Quarry in Burton Hill. Ruth Houghton, Shropshire Councillor for Bishop's Council. Hilary Love, Councillor for Church Dressing and Craven Arms. Kate Halliday, Councillor for Belting and Shooting. And just behind me in the stalls, we have uh, <coughs> Nick Marsley, Deputy Portfolio Holder of Children's Services, Councillor for Wrighton and Bastridge. Yeah, and I think uh, the Portfolio Holder will be joining us remotely. And Daniel Weber will be the screen officer. Yep, and we've got Daniel here as well. OK, so uh, item number one is apologies. Um, Councillor Peggy Mullock is uh, unfortunately away, so she's being substituted by Chris Schofield and Kevin Turley isn't, uh, isn't here today. Uh, item number two is disclosable pecuniary interests. Um, and whilst it's not normally, normally any of us say anything at this juncture. I think considering the items we've got today, um, just to remind the people who are joining us, we are all corporate parents for all our looked after children. So in that respect, we do have a vested interest and I think it's probably important to for you to understand that. Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, minutes held on the meeting of the 23rd of May. Do move the minutes. Yep, David's moving the minutes. Henry's seconding them. Is everyone uh, okay with the minutes? Yes, yep. I'm just wondering, um, have, um, have our visitors who, um, oh, perhaps I'll to introduce our visitors. Sorry, if we're all here. Do you want to introduce yourselves from the top left or? Uh, we don't know you. It's Miller. Miller, say who you are and who you represent. Right, my name is Miller Bonus. Uh, I'm Head of Transformation and Commissioning for Children and Young People's uh, Mental Health, and that includes neurodevelopment mental conditions uh, with the CCG until tomorrow, and then it will be with the ICS from Friday onwards. And then the next one's Kathy Riley, I think. Could I just check that everybody could hear me fine? Yes, because I, I will could, be actually. doing most of the presenting. Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. Hello, I'm Kathy Riley. I'm Managing Director of Shropshire Telford and Reeking Care Group, which is part of Midlands Partnership Trust. We provide all age mental health services in Shropshire Telford and Reeking, including the BU service. I'm hoping that uh, one of our service managers from BU will be joining shortly. Her name's Anna Deakin. Thank you. Is Anna Deakin there? 
Yeah, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm. Um, hello, my name's Anna Deacon and I'm the service manager for the <coughs> Camp Service. Thank you. And then Claire Parker. Thank you, Chair. I'm uh, Claire Parker. Uh, at the moment, I'm Director of Partnerships for Shropshire Telfton Reekin CCG. From Friday, I'll be Director of Partnerships in place for um, the ICB. Um, and in my portfolio, I have uh, children's mental health and LDNA. OK, thank you. And I think Kirsty, our portfolio holders there as well. Yeah, um, I'm Chair, I'm late. I've just come off a course and I'm going to fit in and out. So. Right, OK, thank you, Kirsty. And Fran, Fran's there as well, are you, Fran? I am indeed, yeah. Good afternoon. My name's Fran Doyle. I'm the Head of Early Help at Shropshire Council. Thank you very much. OK, so um, we have no public questions, no member questions. So, uh, Mila, would you like to uh, talk to the report before we um, start the debate? Yes, uh, I'm going to share my screen now, if that's OK. Yeah. Oh, hang on. So it says only meeting organisers and presenters can share. So can somebody change that for me so that I can Put my slides up. There we go. Somebody's done that for me. OK, I'm hoping that the uh, everybody's got sight of the screen now. Yeah, yeah, I can see the screen, thank you. So I think my brief today is to talk through children and young people's mental health. <coughs> and I described it as developing a whole system strategic approach. Uh, I'm hoping that the system will be entirely interactive and that people will feel able to comment and uh, ask questions as we go along. And um, as you heard in the introductions, we've got Anna here who's service manager for the service, uh, Cathy who is the managing director for the service and also from the CCG we've got Claire who's director of partnerships and I hope that they too will feel free to chip in and help uh, as we go along. OK, just some background information to start with uh, and I promise that we're going to get to some uh, some facts and figures shortly uh, we, no, we won't shy away from the, the reality of the situation. So to begin with, uh, World Health Organization has said that COVID has triggered a 25% increase in prevalence and anxiety, uh, so prevalence of anxiety and depression worldwide. And the NHS is saying that there are 25% increase in referrals compared to the same period last year, and it's actually up by 65% before the pandemic. And that's certainly the experience of the service is that there's been a, an avalanche of referrals come in uh, in the last six months or so, as the data will show a bit later on. I thought it'd be useful just to look at what the prevalence of mental health disorders is, and this data is specific to Shropshire. I've got similar tables for Telford and Rekin and for the whole system together, but this is the Shropshire data. It's based on a survey from NHS Digital undertaken last year, which describes that there are probably mental health disorders. Uh, can you see my pointer moving around? OK. There are probable disorders amongst 10,329 uh, individuals aged between 6 and 23. There's a possible disorder for 7,115 and the unlikely to have a disorder, which are equally important actually, is around about 42,000. So that's the order of magnitude potential for mental health disorder in Shropshire. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. And just another fact and figure, the survey also looked at the prevalence of eating problems. This is different from eating disorders. Eating disorders are at the end of the spectrum where patients are likely to be referred in into, into the mental health services. This is uh, an extrapolation of those who have the possibility that they're likely to head for eating problems. 
and the, the actual percentages, if you look at, up at the 20 to 23 year olds and the 17 to 19 year olds, the percentages are around 60% of the population have a prevalence or a tendency uh, towards eating problems. I'd like to talk a little bit about the iThrive model. It's a model for care. Some of you may be familiar with the old CAMS model, which has is like a triangle with four levels, one, two, three and four. Uh, the iThrive model is slightly different uh, and is one that's gaining credibility nationwide and is one that uh, the Shropshire Telford system has expressed an interest in, in going along with. And we have already had three training sessions which have been attended not just by people from the health side, but there were attendee, attendees from Shropshire uh, Local Authority and from and from Telford and also from the par parent group, Pack and Pods. And what it's based on is that the majority of the population are thriving. But when things start to go a little bit rocky, then there's a move into needing to get advice. And then from there, it might be that people need some help and they might need more help. And a very small number actually will go over and need crisis care, getting risk support. But what I like to do with a diagram like this is actually put arrows going back the other way because the interventions that we seek to give actually are pushing people back around the model into lower levels of dependency and hopefully back into thriving. A key fact, the majority of mental health disorders begin before the age of 18. So prevention and early intervention are essential around about the thriving and the getting advice stages. So those are particularly important. And I've just put up here a diagram that comes from yourselves, from your integrated place partnership, which shows the way in which you describe the services you offer. And it's not a million miles away from the iThrive model. So if we just go back to the iThrive model and then superimpose on top of it the prevalence data that I showed you before, you could sort of say that there are 7,115 people who have possibly have a disorder and so therefore they're sitting at the getting advice, perhaps getting a little bit of help part of the diagram. And you could say that there are 10,329 people with a probable disorder who are around on the higher levels of dependency and intensity of treatment required. So I said before, let's not forget the 42,000 because we've got to try and keep them in the thriving part of the diagram. So I thrive, aligning service teams. So how might we organise the teams uh, that uh, BU provide around this diagram? So I'm going to invite Anna to just go through the various teams that there are and where they sit on the diagram. Thank you, Miller. So we have our access, which we describe as the front door of our services. So this is the first point that um, our referrals will reach. Um, and we're looking at the way that we do this and are we doing this in line with what's happening nationally and what's best for our young people? So that's where the referral will be received, will be looked at, will be made sense of and then it, there will be a variety of actions that may happen from there. So when we talk about signposting, we talk about those services where those children's needs might be best met. And that might be considering the I Thrive circle that we've just looked at anywhere within 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 that loop of support. The core service is what we describe as the core part of our service. It should be for those children who are in that section of the I Thrive model about getting more help. So those children who perhaps have tried some of the things within the earlier stages of, of the I Thrive model and perhaps that hasn't been effective or perhaps that they haven't been noticed until they've reached a certain point. And so they will come into our core services to receive um, either assessment if that hasn't happened previously or an evidence based treatment that's indicated for the difficulty that they're experiencing. And we also work with their families and the systems that surround those children as well. 
Uh, can I just ask a question? Is, is that what you want? You want to yes, ask? please. Yes. OK, so um, that sounds good. But um, what I find frustrating in the report is um, there's precious little about it, outcomes or performance data. So it would be really helpful to know some facts like the number of children waiting to be triaged. Uh, the time it takes for uh, the children to actually get help mm -hmm. and the time between the triage and the actual allocation of uh, of care. Some uh, of those facts are coming up shortly. Some of those facts are coming up shortly, yeah. They are. Thank you. So our eating disorder service is a small part of our service that will see children who may be experiencing eating distress that Miller referenced earlier, but they will those that are um, experiencing eating disorders will progress to have more help and the risk support around around their um, needs. And we know that this cohort of children are some of our most poorly children within services. And so it's a very intensive and very specialist area um, of our service. They also work with those that we've mentioned in the core service for those children who may not reach the threshold um, of a diagnosis for an eating disorder, but those children that Miller's talked around who are experiencing some eating distress. And we try and put that into context for the young person and support them in the way that they need. Our crisis resolution and home treatment service is a growing part of our service and this part of our service will deal with will manage with those children and families who are experiencing a crisis in their mental health. Um, they offer some treatment um, at home and they work also with our core services because we know that some of the children that use other parts of our services will sometimes unfortunately experience a crisis in their mental health and that's sometimes in relation to what's happening for them um, and so they may require some specialist support. The intention is that the crisis aspect of the service will be for the shortest term possible so that we return those children to those areas of service that they're most familiar with and that are evidence based for their support. So that's why we work really closely with all areas of our service, because we're aware um, that any of our children can require this. They also do a lot of work with the um, inpatient ward for those children who have been admitted for um, a variety of different reasons, sometimes self harm um, and they work um, really intensively with all of those systems around that young person to ensure a really robust package of care. They also negotiate um, with um, regard to those patients who may require a specialist um, bed, inpatient bed for that care. And part of the work that they do is reducing the need for our young people to go into a hospital provision because we know that very often that's not the best place for them to be. They want to be near their home and within their communities. Um, but that um, they also work to reduce the length of stay in an inpatient bed so that that young person can return to their family and their friends and their education and all of those things that sometimes um, inpatient provision can, can cause difficulties with. They are seven days a week and 24 hours a day. The mental health support teams are a specialist group of people who go um, into schools and work with schools to support that early intervention and prevention that we talked about that's incredibly important and they support um, our colleagues throughout education to understand children's mental health and to try and meet the needs of those young people in their own environment. So that care that's closest to not just home, but their education settings and increase the confidence in those people working with young people who are showing signs of distress or behavioural difficulties to help understand the context in which that behaviour might be happening and um, to manage, manage that so that it doesn't progress. And if it does, and they are concerned and there are more difficulties there. Again, this team can liaise with any of the teams that we're talking about today to see whether there's any further support that that young person might need with regard to their mental health. OK, so I'll let you breathe there a minute. Uh, OK, so two questions. Um, two concerns really at, at this juncture. 
Um, young children with additional needs are not being able to get the helpful pathway in time, so they're ending up in residential care. And also, the, the other point is there are children who, OK, you're now doing this crisis work moving forwards, but what about all the children you've left behind? So, for instance, I was having a conversation with one of the officers the other day and uh, there was a child, under 11 child, who who didn't get the support they were they, they needed from um, from the mental health team and, and they are now in residential care. That to me is just appalling. I think it's always a challenge with those young people um, that uh, I think it's it's a system wide working and I think that's something that we're talking about today is how do we work as a system to ensure that those children have their needs met across the board because we know that these children that are going into residential care and experiencing difficulties it's not just around their mental health it's very often around the system around them so it's often the support that's required comes from a variety of different sources and I think we need to improve how we talk to each other and how we work together and how we think most helpfully about that young person's needs at the lowest level possible. Um, so it, 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 it's very much a challenge to do that, but I think that's what today's presentation is about in regard to improving all of those conversations and that system working to ensure that where it isn't necessary that we support those children sort of earlier on in their in their journey. And there are always those sad cases where that doesn't happen, where we listen really carefully to where we could have done things better or how the system could have done things better so that we are better at strengthened to be able to understand the needs of our young people. OK, I've got other comments to make about about the report, but I will uh, I'll let you finish your presentation first. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Claire Park has got her hand up. Sorry. And I've got is Peggy on, on the call, Ashley. Peggy joins us remotely. OK, Ashley. Sorry, Claire. Claire Parker. Thanks, Chair. I, I think um, I think we have to recognise that that historically this has been a poorly invested service and that we've had some real challenges and we still have real challenges around some of the workforce and the investment. I think I'm more encouraged with the work that we're doing now and have been doing over the past few weeks as we sort of come out of the winter period post pandemic that we're starting to look at what the support is because I also um, look after primary care and I know from our GPs they're not necessarily feeling some of the benefits um, although they are starting to see some of the green shoots so I think that's a really that's really positive but we're not where we need to to be yet um, but I think we do need to acknowledge that it's just been really really challenging it's been poor for our children it's been poor for their families and carers um, and we just need to acknowledge that and just make sure that we do we get this right now that we're um, we're keeping scrutiny updated that we're working through our health and well-being boards and our places to ensure that we're really making this a priority in the system Kathy yeah. uh, you know, Riley uh, and I think Roy wanted to say something Kathy Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. It was just really not to take it off on a tangent, but just to pick up the residential placement bit. Obviously, some of the support and care is uh, commissioned by the CCG, but also some of it comes through spe specialised commissioning in NHS e and I, um, particularly around the inpatient beds, tier four, but also support to, uh, to try and prevent admissions to tier four. And particularly around residential placements, the new provider collaborative that's only been working for a short time in the West Midlands is doing some work around residential placements in particular. They're developing a regional team, the intensive residential outreach team, which is going to support um, residential homes for children, um, providing behaviour and intervention support. This is really good news because it's really needed. Um, but uh, it is going to be another 18 months or so before that is rolled out to Shropshire, Telford and Rekin. 
but it's something that we are really excited about because it's been something that's been really missing in the system. So I just suppose I was trying to make the point there's some good news there, but also to say that not all the commissioning responsibility is within our system. Some of it comes at a regional on a regional basis. Thank you, Chair. I think it's easy to talk in these meetings and push it down the line, but you know, when you're a parent or a carer or a corporate parent, you know, being told it's 18 months away is just simply not good enough. Uh, Roy, you want to make a point? Yeah, uh, um, just want to ask really, uh, recruitment, you're talking a lot of specialists and I'm concerned. What, what, what are your plans for recruitment of these specialists and how uh, How's the team at the moment? Does it need developing? Does it need expanding? Um, yeah. Come corner. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, what I'm saying is, have you got the staff in place at the moment to to, to do the job? Yeah, Kathy, sorry, yes, I noticed you got your hand up. I thought you were just going to respond. Sorry. Sorry, I wasn't sure whether you wanted me to respond. No, no, yes, of course I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have got some vacancies in the team. We are filling those with locums. It's particularly around the higher end specialist skills that we've got vacancies for. And there is a national problem, particularly around CAM psychiatrists. There aren't sufficient numbers of those being developed nationally and they tend to go to systems who have got inpatient units. So and rural areas like Shropshire is particularly difficult to recruit. So we've got locums in place and we are doing some work in terms of skill mixing to see how we can supplement the um, senior leaders that we've got with other roles such as non-medical prescribers, some more psychology support. So some some people that we can develop and some some people that we can recruit to supplement what we've got in terms of locums. We have got um, one substantive consultant and then we've got some consultants because Middle Partnership Trust covers Staffordshire as well. We have consultant CAMS psychiatrists working over from Staffordshire to provide some extra sessional support. Sorry, I, uh, <clears throat> that's quite a comprehensive answer for us. <laughs> Still got a little question. So, what's the plan? You know, you're saying 18 months. This this is going to be going ahead. Um, how are you going to attract these staff in, and when are you going to get permanent uh, posts in rather than the locums? Forgive me, I got confused. I thought you were talking about generally in the service. But the IROC team it is region who are recruiting that team. It's not, as I said. Some of the support that is required in our system will be regionally commissioned and supplied. It won't be from our local system. So it is it is on a regional footprint that they are recruiting these staff. So I can't answer that question because I'm not responsible for it. Right, thank you. OK, all right, Kirsty. Try to keep this brief. I've got lots of questions and comments. Uh, First one's to you, Miller. First, um, the prevalence of mental health, the, the data. You said that's last year. When does the new data come out, just out of interest? Uh, well, they uh, they do this. This originates from a patient survey that they did okay. in 21. I'm not aware that they've done one this year. So uh, those are those are the data that we have at the moment. OK, thank you. Uh, Claire, really welcome the green shoot comment. I know we're working on several platforms together. So, you know, anything we can do as a local authority, but we know this is a problem. So, you know, we know this collaborative working is, 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 is just strengthening. And uh, Kathy, tier four beds, great news, 18 months disappointed. I know you feel that in the room, you know, that's come through the chair, but so currently, I don't know if you're able to answer this, if we needed a tier four bed, there isn't one in Shropshire. Is that what you're saying? There's, there's no plan to have a tier four bed in Shropshire. So okay. these are all these are all regionally commissioned beds. Okay. Uh, and at the moment they remain the responsibility of specialised commissioning in NHS England and improvement. There is a plan, and in other regions this has happened more quickly, that it provides a collaborative working on a regional footprint, takes more control over the commissioning and um, bed management of these beds, but that's not something the system has control over. So okay. if if any of our children need a bed, we contact 
the provider collaborative and they do the gatekeeping and the bed management around those beds. The closest, and so the tier four providers are a mixture of independent yeah. and NHS. So the closest independent is the Hunter Coom, which is just across our borders, isn't it, from Telford in yeah. Staffordshire. And then the closest NHS one is the Darwin unit in North Staffs combined. Okay. Thank you. And Anna, very briefly, sorry, I know there's lots of questions. Um, really pleased that you're saying, you know, that historically we know we didn't get it right. And, and I thank that. I welcome that comment. So are you saying now that we are in a better position, young children getting help quicker, the crisis team? You, you feel there's a quicker movement to get help for young people now? In the crisis team that, that we're, we're certainly working very hard, but I think um, I came into post in April, so we have a new leadership team. So there's my um, my immediate uh, who I report to and a new quality and governance lead. So we are becoming familiar with the system, what's happening and what needs to happen. So we're working together with the senior leadership team in terms of that. That's certainly our desire and that's what we're working towards. That what That's what we all work towards. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So I forgot Claire, Kevin's hardly the right person to ask you. Sorry, who asked Claire? Um, Claire, did you want to come back before Kevin asked his question? Uh, yes, I was just going to uh, respond really to Kirsty and the tier four issue. Actually, what we want to get to is a position where we don't need tier four beds because the support that we've got from tiers one to three, well, actually using the iThrive model, we don't have to put our young, uh, our young people into tier four beds because the evidence would suggest that an inpatient stay is not necessarily a good thing for a child. But we are, because of the, the increased demand and actually the acuity of some of our young people, we are really kind of having to manage that demand at the same time as ensuring that that prevention model is robust and in place. And I suppose the other bit, just a feedback from the green shoots is, um, the GPs are starting to feel more communicated with because they are getting um, clear plans for those children and what's happening. And I think that's been the difference that sometimes the access has been quick, but ne not necessarily understanding what the plan is. And actually in that short period of time, they've already seen that improvement. So that's what we're kind of building on really. So it was just to respond to those points from Kirsty. Yeah, and, and that goes back to my point. Sorry to keep harping on about it, but OK, you've drawn a line and you're improving. What I'm saying is what about the poor kids at the other side of the line? When are you going to pull them along? You know, that's the point because you've got a lot of kids in, in tier four or whatever you you call it. And that's what concerns me is the kids that aren't going to get this help. So the tier four, tier four beds at the moment, I think we've got about seven children in tier four beds. The length of stay varies, but usually we've got a lower length of stay than other areas. So it, in terms of tier four, it's, it's usually no more than about seven there. We are particularly high users of tier four in our system, and we continue to work, as Claire says, to, to put systems in place to try and stop, to stop the need for it, because the evidence basis for children that you don't tend to get good outcomes from admission to tier four units. So one of the things we're doing at the moment is working very much with other agencies around uh, multi-agency huddles around children who are beginning to escalate and we're developing a register for those so that we're keeping, we're able to work together to put more interventions in place in the community to try and prevent the need for tier four. Yeah, sorry, I got that wrong really. I didn't mean tier four, I meant the four kids who are in residential care and we'll be staying there. If I just come in there, I just wonder if we can take an action as a system to, to look at the children that are in currently looks after care in Shropshire for us to review, review them and um, collectively between the council and MPFT to, to see if we can do a different offer with those young people that historically have not been able to access um, services for a variety of reasons. Now we've got a different it's a different page, I guess, in, in, the, in, the, in the new book. It will be a good opportunity to review um, some of those young people to see if we can do something differently and um, with them. If you but could just park that one, then I'm going to talk shortly about the uh, intermediate care system and the newly formed Mental Health Children and Young People's Group. Uh, and one of the subgroups 
uh, of that is specifically to look at look after children and that will be a whole system where where there are all branches of the NHS and local authorities and patient groups who are represented on those groups but I'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail about three or four slides further on. Okay uh, so Kevin you've been very patient do you like to ask a question? It's a, it's a question is it Kathy is it Kathy Riley? Yeah. Um, you, you were talking about um, um, beds uh, uh, and that these, these young people, seven of them at the moment, are out of region. Um, are there any facilities or any support for parents? Because um, I'm sure children, uh, some of these children, need contact with their family. So is there any help for them? And the reason I ask that is because when you read through the reports, a lot of these children come from poorer backgrounds. Again, and I'm sorry, but because we don't provide those services and neither does our system commission them, I, I can't really help. You really need to invite SPECCOM to the meeting to be able to answer some of that for you. And then when I say that they are, they're not necessarily out of region, most of them will be in region, but the provision of the bed is on a region, it's, it's on a national footprint. There's a majority of our children who try to get within region, we just haven't got any beds within this system. Thank you. Sorry, I can't okay. answer this. Oh, okay, Miller, we'll let you we'll let you continue. I think. Okay, I'll just let Anna finish off uh, the BU teams uh, right, okay. description. So the next one is learning disability. Thank you. Our learning disability is a small team of specialist um, provision for those children with a learning disability and mental health, severe mental health difficulties. Um, they also work with each area of our service if there are children who are requiring help um, across the service, but they offer, they um, <coughs> There are some specialist psychologists within that team and a specialist nurse prescriber. They've worked very hard to reduce prescribing in this group of young young people and in that are increasing their therapeutic provision um, to complete that gap. So it's a small team um, who are working really hard to their ambition of being able to do that. Uh, uh, sorry, Ruth wanted to ask a question. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I waited to see if it came up on the slide, actually, and it hasn't. But the mental health support team in schools. Do you want to turn your mic on? It's not working. Fine. Right. Right. That's that better? Yeah. Um, I waited until the slide was finished because I'm just interested to know what happens during the school holidays with the mental health support team in schools. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. can happen during six weeks of summer holidays. Is there any low level mental health support as described? I'm, I'm not sure about the answer to that question because I'm new to the team and new to ah. support uh, teams. But from what I understand, some of the work with schools continues through the summer holidays and there's also packages of care that are written and um, there are interventions that those practitioners oh. do with young people and with, with, the, with the support network around those young people. So I know that the work doesn't stop during the holidays, but it's not something that I can... <gasps> because I, I haven't been with the service um, long enough to know the detailed answer to that question but I know that there's a lot of preparatory work that they do they're also a growing service so they they've been very um, forward thinking with their recruitment and they also work with the local authority in terms of which which is the next group um, of schools and teams that come on board to support that so they're doing a lot of work um, behind the scenes to be able to to, to um, ensure that their provision continues. Just wanted to add on to Anna's. I'm aware that in some of the schools they work, if they can get access to the school during the during the school holidays, they will provide clinics there and they have done that in some schools. If you wanted to get some further detail around that, we can do that after the meeting. Yeah, that'd be really helpful. Is that, is that all right, Ruth? Yes. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. OK, the next one, Anna, is intensive support team. 
Thank you, Mela. The intensive support team is a new team. They work intensively with around four families at a time, and it is those young people who have a learning disability and severe mental health difficulties. So they have things like a positive behaviour support worker. They have a family and systemic therapist working with them so that they're really able to, as it says, intensively work with that family to support them to be able to move through the I Thrive model that we described earlier um, in terms of, of being able to improve those outcomes and the support that those children and families receive from us. Our ADHD team are a team that provide diagnosis for ADHD and there are also follow up clinics associated with that in terms of the prescribing that happens um, for that um, particular cohort of young people. And they will also work and liaise with those um, other agencies like education to be able to have a really clear picture of what that young person's needs are. Um, and again, they will also liaise with each aspect of our services required um, if that young person has any other difficulties that present throughout that assessment, even if that might not be ADHD and they achieve a positive diagnosis for that, it may be that there are other difficulties that, that require our support. So we consider um, all of the mental health needs of that young person. The ASD team also, they are a diagnostic pathway, so they are a group of people who will um, have those specialist assessment skills to understand and um, provide action for diagnosis for young people with, um, with autism. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's what they do. I notice Claire's got her hand up underneath, I think. And, okay. and, uh, uh, and Hilary. Hilary, can um, I ask you a question first? OK, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering, um, with the autism, what's the youngest age that a child can be diagnosed with autism? You know, working in early years as I do, I'm just wondering if we're, what the age? Would be the We're an all age service, but we do have a specialist psychologist who will advise with those children who are under five. And of course, our mental health support teams are very active in working in terms of um, understanding behaviours in young people. So we tend to work to the model of assess, plan and do, which is looking at children's behaviour, trying to put some support in to resolve those difficulties, advice um, with the family where that's concerned. And we may choose not to, the family may or may not choose to progress to a diagnosis but the majority of diagnoses will tend to happen later on in the child's um, journey, but the support will happen. But there are other agencies that we work with in regard to those younger age children. So there will be some liaison that will happen with our paediatric colleagues, um, health visitors. So I think our psychologist that works in that particular pathway does um, consultation and advice to health visitors um, and to family nurse partnerships, those, those people who work with those children and families who are at the younger end where the families might be concerned that there are some behaviour difficulties um, that may be consistent with a, with a diagnosis of autism. Uh, can I just, yeah. How, how um, does a family refer if they've got concerns about their child having possible autism? <coughs> Do they do that through their GP? Most of the time they'll do, their family will choose to do that through the education um, provision because that's where the child is observed for a large portion of their day and they will be undertaking activities in school, both structured and unstructured, that allow um, the education practitioners perhaps to observe some of those behaviours and support what the family is saying. But they also have some provision in schools, so they will look at different nurture groups and lots of different things that the, that the schools might do that might support that young person. Um, but of course, we have our access provision where all referrals are received. Can I, can I just uh, ask a question? How many of the looked after children are open to be you? I'm afraid I couldn't give you that exact number this afternoon. I wasn't expecting to be asked that question, so I do apologise. I think you have got that figure. I, don't, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but we, we had a report quite recently showing what proportion was. It wasn't a huge, it was a lower number than I was expecting. But we can make that figure available, I think. Yeah, OK, 
Thank you. Uh, Kevin wants to answer the question. Can we talk about the report that we were forwarded earlier this week? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, I think you just want to do the presentation and then we'll get on to the report. On to Bali. Well, yeah, yeah. OK, fine. Thank you, Madam. OK, uh, looked after children then, uh, Anna. So we have practitioners within our um, looked after children pathway who provide consultation and advice and some direct work with those children who, who are looked after. Um, and we provide that for both those children who are from Shropshire, Telford and Rekin, um, and to those people, people working with them. But we do have a high number of children who are placed with us from out of county um, and those numbers have increased um, during the COVID period. Um, and some of that is around the provision that's available in the county and the rurality um, in terms of placing children here. So we do have, I think, with the second highest provider of um, out of area placements for young people. And Miller's just put up our partnership agencies that work, we work with in order to provide that I Thrive model. So that model of care from um, BEAM who provide a drop in. So that means that any young people and their families can access the service via the, the, the drop in process that they offer and they can receive advice, um, guidance and signposting about where to get help within their community. We have COOF, which is our online provider who provide counselling and online resources and support. Um, and we have Helios who um, provide um, online support for our children and young people with mental health difficulties. So they will um, provide um, a cognitive behavioural therapy model for those young people who require that evidence based treatment. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Is this a good point just to pause for further questions? Cathy, Cathy, you've got your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yes, yeah, I just wanted to cite the uh, committee on a particular issue that we have in MPFT around looked after children. Anna mentioned the placed looked after children, which we provide a service for. That is not a service that's commissioned by our system. So actually we receive no funding for the support that we, we appropriately give to those children. And prior we, there was a way of recharging, but the NHS has now changed its financial arrangements. So it's something that we are um, highlighting with regional colleagues because we have no way of getting any funding in to staff the support that we give to those looked after children that are placed with us. That's something that we are obviously escalating through, any, through the NHS, but I just thought it would be useful for you to understand that because that is a significant number of looked after children and can put extra pressure on our services. Uh, can I just push back a bit there? Yeah. Um, because um, I, you know, I know because I go through the budgets that Shropshire Council last year picked up £650,000 um, of, uh, of mental health work for children who were, who were subject to a court order or um, because the NHS didn't have the time or the inclination to do it. So, so I think, you know, it, we could sit here all afternoon and, you know, back backwards and forwards about it, but it's not going to help the children. Now, I suppose the point, I'm sorry, making a different point is that we are providing, we need to provide care to these children. They are our most vulnerable children, yes. aren't they? But, but there isn't a funding route for us around those because of the current financial arrangements in the NHS. So it's something that we are escalating to try and resolve that. <clears throat> That's all I'm saying. It's not anything between the local authorities and ourselves. It's been around particular funding routes that we've got issues with at the moment. Just I, don't, I don't understand that. The National Health Service is exactly that. Ha, ha, you know, the National Health Service surely can't say, well, we're not funding this particular cohort of people. I, I don't understand that. Yeah. I, I, is there anything that the committee can do to, to support you with that? There is a concern So we know that we've got 622 Shropshire children looked after, but we also know there are over 400 children placed in Shropshire from other local authorities. And I think what you're telling committee is that, that 400 plus children placed in this county by other local authorities, you don't receive funding for. Exactly. So is there anything you want to ask this committee to do in terms of supporting 
um, you in, 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 in escalating that because the net that result be, of that will be less that would, effective for the Shropshire children. That would be really helpful and I, I can give you the details Tanya of who you would need to write to in the regional team around that. They are aware of it but I think your support would be really helpful because obviously we're stretching the support for Shropshire, Telford and Reakin children by not getting the funding that we need around those other looked after children. Kathy, sorry, yeah. can I just talk there very briefly? Kathy, just so you know, Maggie's done me a briefing on that and I'll share it with Tanya and they got it the other day. Um, and we, uh, I've agreed that we will escalate it up through the Directors of Children's Services Network as well. Thank you so much for that. That would be really helpful. Okay, thank you. We've got two questions, Chris and uh, Chair. Do you want to ask a question? Thank you, Chair. Can, can I just, can you just clarify that the NHS don't um, look at people with autism? Anybody? Sorry, I don't understand the question. We don't. Um, what's... Do, they, do they diagnose people with aut the children with autism? There is a diagnosis pathway for children with autism, yes. From the NHS? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Kevin, would you like to ask your question? And then, I think Kirsty wants to say something. We haven't gone on to the main bit yet, Kirsty. It could be a long day. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for dialing um, from the EU. Um, I was talking to a parent not too long ago, uh, and her, her daughter, uh, which to use the services of being a drop-in drop service. And at the time, and, and your picture of a drop-in service is somebody just popping into a building and hopefully get a little bit of help. And at the time she was told that um, they couldn't deal with it because they had too many on their books. How, what's the situation now? The BEAM service don't, don't have books, so they, the drop-in clinic is, is, is exactly as described. It's it's that open access. I suppose there may be occasions that if there were very large numbers of children that turned in for, a, for turned up for a drop-in, there may there may be a wait to be able to speak to somebody, but they 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 don't hold um they they don't hold a set number of children that they're able to see, as far as I'm aware. But I'm surprised to hear that. Perhaps Kevin could email you details. Yeah, if I can remember. Yeah. It was. But, but the situation was that she couldn't use Beam because of the number of people using it. OK, I'd welcome a little bit more information so I could look into yeah. to perhaps what happened there. Uh, Ruth, sorry, Ruth. I have questions on Beam as well. I haven't heard of it before, so I've just had a quick Google. Um, I notice that there are two um, drop-in sessions in Tuffle and Recon, one in Shrewsbury at the Lambs on a Monday, so no wool provision at all. Do you have any plans to um, spread that out further across the county to include those rural areas? I think that's very much a challenge with the resource that we have. That's quite a, a small resource, so we try to put those um, services in the areas where most people can reach them. So I think we do look at, at how our young people and families in our outlying communities might might be able to to reach those services. But I know that they've provided through COVID in particular some digital resources and some online groups so that at least they're, that they're able to offer some service for, for for those young people. But I, I, I guess that's something for the for the future decisions about how how we do our service and how we, how we operate that that um, yeah, we, we gather that information and we have those conversations with our partners all the time about their provision, where they're used, how they're used and and how 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 they might be better used and accessed by young people. Uh, uh, Chair, would it be possible to have that data as part of, the net of a, a follow up to this session so that we can see where referrals are coming from and how far people have to travel to access those services, please? Yeah, yeah, that sounds fair enough, Ruth. Thank you. Kirsty, you had your hand up before, have you? Yeah, no, it's covered by Tanya, exactly okay. the same, sinking at the same time, but we'll probably get our heads together outside of this meeting, Tanya. Thank you, Chair. Is that the end of those questions? I'll move on. Yep. 
OK, the next little section, I want to just to talk a little bit about the current situation. Uh, we've had two fairly major reports in the last six months. One is known as the Morehouse report, and I think you you or your officers will have been cited of this because it was a whole system report. Uh, and then there was specifically uh, a review of MPFT BU services undertaken by the NHSE review. Uh, now, this is a very busy slide and I don't plan to talk about it in any great detail, but I put it in so that when the slides are made available to you after the meeting, you, you can look at uh, what's included on here and direct specific questions if you have them. But they divided into these, these basic seven sections. OK, thank you very much. We'll have a look at that afterwards if that's. Yes, do. Yeah. I just wanted to spend a few minutes now talking about the integrated care system, which comes into formal being on Friday. Uh, the new integrated care partnership is attempting to create a much better opportunity for closer working together as the norm. So what I've actually done is I've set a, ahead of this, I've set up the integrated care system, children and young persons mental health group, which has already met. Uh, and the membership is from all of these organisations. So in the green, we've got all the NHS based organisations. In the yellow, we've got the local authority elements, the main elements. We've got the voluntary organisation and the patient voice groups in the blue and then police and justice in the pink. So it, this is becoming a, a principal forum for everybody to come together and look towards issues, problems and particularly transformation opportunities uh, as we look to the way in which patients flow from one organisation to another. And I suppose uh, an autism assessment is a good example in that the child is moving from school to health and back again with then if they have an EHCP uh, in place, then there will be services being provided all across organisational boundaries. Can I just make a, a comment at this point? Yes. So, I mean, in some ways, I think this is, um, I suppose exciting is the wrong word, but, but it's better because everyone seems to be getting together. In my opinion, looking at this, just looking at it is, OK, you're all getting together. But for me, as well, I'm sitting here in the chair, but as, as a person, as a parent, uh, I want to know how you're going to perform. You know, where on there does it say that you're going to monitor the outputs or, or do anything about the performance? Because people need to understand and know what you're doing. And I think that's been, <laughs> it, it, it's lacking in this and it's also lacking in the report we're going to talk about next. Um, I actually chair the um, Performance Scrutiny Committee here at Shropshire Council. Uh, and I would say to you here and now, I will volunteer to work with you to come up with some performance indicators that I can take to my committee and this committee. Um, because I just worry, the thing looks like a wheel and I don't want the wheel rolling down the hill without me measuring how fast it's going, what distance is covered, if you get what I mean. Yeah, well, what I'm coming on to uh, in two slides time is that there's a series of subgroups, one of which uh, I've already mentioned the crisis care one, but one of them is to do with quality assurance data and key performance indicators. Right. Uh, and in actual fact, uh, uh, your Siobhan Hughes from the Shropshire Local Authority, who is part of the mental health partnership group, has volunteered to actually lead that group uh, along with myself. So. Uh, there'll be great opportunity and, and I would welcome your input. OK, so that's. That's a date then, is it? We can we can sort that out because, you know, I, I just think if we're going to work together and have confidence in what we're doing, we have to be able to see exactly what we are doing. And I did notice actually, and I think it was in the other paper we're going to look at in a minute, there were task and finish groups and a bit of something in there. So we've that's exactly that. right. Yeah. yeah. So I did notice that. I've got some comments on that. Yeah, Roy, did you want to say something? 
Yeah, just interested uh, as to who is going to actually lead, you know, um, all these bodies. Um, I, I just think it's, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, it's quite an achievement to get them all together. <laughs> but how, how are you going to get them to talk to each other towards a common objective? And, and who is going to take the lead in that? Well, in terms of the leadership of the actual mental health partnership, I am the chair. And that's my role as as uh, CCG commissioner. Uh, now, when we come to the working groups, uh, what I will describe to you is that in actual fact, I've had volunteers from all of the organisations. So some of them will be led from the NHS, some will be led from the local authority. And in fact, the cross cutting issues, uh, your own Sarah Thomas and Zara from PAC uh, will be with co-production and the involvement of uh, user experience is crucially important in developing strategy. Uh, and so the leadership, I'm, I'm fairly confident that the leadership's fairly robust. <laughs> okay, Ruth, you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've just been pondering about the um, tier four beds and the seven children currently in them. And I'd just like some reassurance as to how um, Shropshire, CCG and your your new um, integrated care partnership on Friday is or will be monitoring the effectiveness of those beds and how you're holding NHS England to account for the outcomes, please. Yep. Uh, Claire, did you want to pick that one up? Um, if you'd like to help me hold NHS England to account, I'd be absolutely delighted with some help with that. When when um, I was the director of quality uh, in 2012, one of the questions I asked was if NHS England are commissioning on behalf of our population, how do we hold them to account when they're delivering specialised services, not just for children and young people, but across all specialist services? So tier three cancer services, et cetera, et cetera. It is a real, real challenge to hold NHS England to account. And actually, when we have, Cathy and I all know this, when we do have escalation calls, it's also really dif difficult. Um, uh, there is an element of, as a, as a, as a system, as a, as a county, we have to come up with solutions and Cathy and I, very often at a weekend and on a Friday evening have come up with solutions for children and young people that have actually worked really, really well when they've escalated. So I think it's a really, really uh, reasonable request actually to ask NHS England, um, you know, how we hold them to account, what they're doing about additional beds and resources, how they're managing that. Um, so I would really, really welcome some support um, around that challenge, actually, because as Cathy says, we we have so little influence over that regional commissioning. I think it would be really, really helpful. OK. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, come back, Ruth, and then Kate's going to ask some questions. I may come back, Chair. Yeah. Yes, the, um, the reason for this question is from uh, you know, my previous role of, of commissioning for people with learning disabilities and how under the Transforming Care Programme, week by week, the NHS England would suddenly find another person belonging to Shropshire. <laughs> and I'd hate these seven children to get lost in that system yeah. because they shouldn't. Uh, and you know, it's really important that as a committee, we're aware of them, where they are, and when they are expected to um, be able to return to, to, to home or to um, the relevant provision within the county. And I think the, the proposal um, around uh, writing to raise awareness of the, the cost as well, something around this could be included in that same correspondence. Because you know, it certainly doesn't sound many, very many people, but it's important that we deal with every single one. I agree wholeheartedly, Ruth, you know, and that's the part I was making before. You know, we can't leave anybody behind. You know, this is, you know, somebody's person, somebody's yeah. child. Uh, Kate. Thank you. Um, have we looked into why our rates are higher for tier four beds? Uh, is it because people aren't accessing services quickly enough? Uh, are there inappropriate referrals? Is any work being done on that? 
In terms of our use of tier four beds, we are not a particularly high user of tier four beds. Miller and I, and I think Claire was there as well this morning, had a getting it right first time, which is a part of NHSCI, they're just benchmarking, we call. <coughs> And it showed very clearly that we're not particularly high users of tier four beds. And actually, when our children are in tier four beds, they're not. They don't benchmark us being in there for a long time. I just wanted to give some reassurance around children when they are in tier four beds. They are all um, care coordinated by our crisis service, so we absolutely know where they are. And there is um, ongoing support between our community team whether that's crisis or the community team, there'll be one or other of them. They'll be linking to those tier four beds. And that's where that register that I talked about that we're developing will actually help with the flow in and out of tier four beds. And we'll have those documented on a register to even strengthen that more. So I just wanted to give some reassurance around that. That is the responsibility of our crisis service to know exactly where those children are and to remain in contact with them. OK, thank you. Have we got any more questions? No. OK. OK, well, moving on. Uh, Children and Young Persons Mental Health Group. I've described the membership. Uh, these it's a jigsaw puzzle as to uh, the what they will actually do, but what they we would like to achieve is to maintain continued growth in mental health investment to transform and expand the service. And sorts of things that we will engage in is to do with collaboration, looking at workforce, which we've already mentioned today, experience and learning from COVID, and there's quite a lot there, particularly relating to digital uh, solutions. Access, reduce the weight. I think everybody is on board with that one. Uh, responding to crisis and urgent care, safety and safeguarding, Population health management, and we work quite closely, quite frequently with Gordon, Gordon Cocaine from your, um, co is it Cocaine? Yes, um, from Shropshire Public Health. Um, exploit digital technologies, I've mentioned that, and the effective use of resources. And I'm just going to leave that one up for a couple of seconds. I've tried to pull out from the terms of reference, these are actually the terms of reference that I'm proposing for the subgroups. Uh, in yellow, some of the uh, important uh, words that uh, that uh, will feature in the work that they do. So I'm going to talk about the subgroups briefly. This is really where the work will be done and where the collaboration and participation um, has its uh, has it the potential for its greatest effect and focusing on the things that really matter. And at the moment, uh, in the first meeting of the mental health groups I held uh, a month ago, uh, we had an open mic type session towards the end, looking at, well, what should these subgroups be? Now, I'm not saying that we're going to run all of these straight away. We might need to pick out which are the most important for now. But as you can see, most areas are covered and there are quite a few cross-cutting themes that will apply to all of them. I'm happy just to pause here for people to pick out ones and comment on on some of them. Um, so, so um, just just reflecting a little bit um, on what we've heard so far this afternoon. Um, I think the concern is that young children with additional needs are not being able to get the help or pathway in time, so end up in in residential care. I think that's one of the main things that's been going through all that. So on that basis, um, are you going to prioritise some of the uh, some of these these subgroups or are you going to try and get them all going going at, what, at once? Yeah, I think we'll probably be prioritising them. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not absolutely certain which will be. Well, I'm going to come up with a slide in a second which suggests where my top priorities are. But yes. I need to be guided by the whole system as to what the system's priorities are. Yeah, because because I think, you know, my take on it is there's a gap in provision for therapeutic support for trauma and abuse, and there's long waits. And, and I think that, you know, has to be a priority, personally. Rich? I can't. 
agree or disagree at the moment, Joe, because I don't know what the weight is. The previous slide. Well, we're, we're two. I think we're two slides away from some of the weight on this data. Two, two, two slides away. Well, I've been getting. I got that from reading the other reports, actually, Ruth. But I still didn't have any answers. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to go back to uh, yeah. you know, two slides back where one of the priorities is reduce the weight, but I don't know what that, need, yeah. that weight needs to be there. And, and that's that's the thing that I've been going on about all the way through. You know, we have to have measured outcomes. We have to have the performance data, right? Right. Two slides on. Be patient. Right. Okay. okay. So I'm almost through on this. Uh, also coming out of the Morehouse report was a series of immediate priorities. Again, this is a slide that you can look at uh, afterwards, but I've picked out from that. Oh, where's it gone? Seem to have missed a slide. I, I'm just going to come out of that and see whether it's actually just. Oh, here we are. It, it, it's just need to unhide it. So the top priorities that I've got for myself just at the moment, uh, but I'm perfectly prepared to be influenced to change, is all around neurodevelopmental assessment and support, which is autism, ADHD and learning disability pathways, crisis care pathways, uh, and Cathy mentioned that we'd been on a seminar this morning, uh, which looked in detail about this. That's definitely one of the subgroups that will be running. Eating disorders, uh, improved data flows, capacity, demand and waiting times. Uh, we have got data and I'm going to show it to you in a second, but data quality is an issue. Looked after children is a priority and workforce planning. So those are the ones that I personally believe to be the top priorities for children and young persons mental health at the moment. Uh, just quickly skip by this one, but this is your own slide, which comes from. Uh, I was given this slide early help and prevention position statement just to show that some of the issues on here actually overlap the things that I've talked about and I'll pick out social prescribing, which is something that uh, is gathering momentum and is very important in terms of keeping people thriving. Uh, and by that I mean people are often referred from their GP to the social prescribing liaison staff uh, and they have access to send people to all sorts of different activities. This is just a selection. OK, facts and figures then. Get to the interesting bit. I thought I'd just put up how much money is in the system. The current contract by the, from the CCG with BU is around about 10 million pounds a year. Uh, and the figure at the top I've just highlighted of five million is the figure that the original contract, which was around about 2016, was. So in actual fact, over time, uh, it's doubled. And new investments I've listed is this 2,386,000 are made up of all sorts of different areas of, of care. So sorry, 10 minutes, sorry. Sorry to be parochial. Yeah. Uh, how much is for Shropshire? Because 10 million is for, you know, the Shropshire Telford and Greenfield, isn't it? So how much well, is I, I would do no more than divide it by the, the split in population. That's the nearest we can get to it, I believe. All right, so it's split on population. So is it about 60, 40? Yeah, a bit more than 60, but roughly. Well, yeah. whatever the numbers are, it's, a, it's not far off that. OK, thank you. So 10 million per year invested up from 5 million five years ago. And a lot of the extra investment is focusing on the early intervention and prevention end of the spectrum. At the moment, the contract, the original contract is what's known as a block contract. It simply says here's five million pounds. There are all sorts of uh, national requirements um, deliver against those. But in actual fact, uh, we're being definitely encouraged to start building individual service level specifications below it. And that's all the various services that Anna described in the slide at the beginning. Miller, could, it, could, it, could I just come in about the, um, the spend in each of the two areas? 
the the event that um, Kathy Miller and I were on this morning, I think Anna was on this morning as well, they did actually break down the cost per child and young person per head of population. And actually it's, uh, it was still in the original CCG, so it was broken down by Telford and Reekin and Shropshire, and it was broadly similar, the spend uh, per head. So it's worked out based on the population. So it's it's about similar. So um, just, just to assure you that um, one side is not getting more than the other. Thank you. Uh, the contract uh, was due to expire this April, just gone, but it's been extended as was allowed within the contract uh, conditions to April 2024. Uh, but that means that thoughts are needed now about what next. And in a way, that's why the subgroups that I described before are so important because they, they can start to form what that, what next needs to be. Uh, we require a lot of outcome KPIs. So Chair, I hope this is music to your ears, yeah. not yeah. just activity and process KPIs. Uh, so we, again, this morning we were hearing that we really need to keep children out of inpatient beds. So an outcome KPI may be uh, that the number of inpatient admissions is kept at a very low level. That will be a good outcome. Yeah. Of course, there are some children that don't actually uh, go into residential care via hospital. I think I'm right. That's right, isn't it, Sonia? So don't don't forget about them because we have a duty of care for them as well. Right. I've mentioned better data quality. It is. You know, I'm a bit of a data nerd, so uh, I'm particularly keen on that one. Now, who invests what on children and young people's mental health? If we're going to have this group that uh, that spans the whole system and all organisations within it, it'd be quite a good idea to actually try and understand how much money is being spent uh, and whether there should be any changes, any shift. Is there duplication? Can we do things better? And I've mentioned that the contract between the NHS and the mental health uh, service of BU is around about 10 million a year. And it might be that over the next few months, we actually try and fill in some of these question marks. So within education, how much money is devoted to to uh, to mental health? You have mental health uh, leads, you have school nurses. There are all sorts of people. Social services is the same, the work that they do towards lack. And public health uh, spend quite a bit of their time on mental health issues. So across across all all users it might be quite useful to come up with a total figure for the spend on men, children and young people's mental health i'd invite you comments on that i think it, it, it may or may not be a good idea but what i'm concerned about is that we just push this down the road because quite clearly there is a, a real issue with getting the services for the children done far quicker and and if you know it's all very well saying who's who spends what but we've got to actually get these get this thing done and help these kids because when we get to the other report i think it's the 17th or 18th version since 2017 and it still doesn't say a lot so, you know, I want some actions and some outcomes. I want to be able to measure what you're doing. Yep. I'll skip past this one. Right, capacity and demand. Uh, in 2022 23, that's the year we're in, the national, the NHSE mental health long term plan sets a target of 7,516 children to have at least one contact with Commission Mental Health Services. Uh, now, in fact, that figure is inclusive of 1,671 that it's targeting at being delivered through the mental health support teams in schools. Now, that figure is a far cry from the 989 high intensity case cases that was the target of 2014, because the 989 are right round at the high intensity end of the I Thrive model, whereas the 7,516 is all around the model from low intensity to high. So that's the target. What's being achieved at the moment 
uh, is uh, based on a 12 month rolling program is about 70 percent uh, and being delivered by these agents. So for BU, they're 2000, nearly 3000 within the organisation itself and then quite a number from those third party agencies that were described earlier. And then a handful from other authorities which sort of out of our out of area. Uh, it might be uh, students in universities somewhere that gets recharged back to us. But anyway, only about 200 there. So predominantly uh, the figure is via uh, BU and the Midland Partnership Fund. And this figure is it's monitored monthly. Uh, we get monthly data on this. Right, waiting lists. This is the current. I've spent quite a lot of time over the last couple of three months trying to improve the data quality in this table. It's beginning to come together. Uh, this is specifically for Shropshire, but again, I have got tables for Telford and Recon and therefore the whole system, but this is Shropshire, which shows at the moment there are 635 children on the waiting list, of whom 186 have been waiting more than 18 months so far and 449 are within the 17, the 18 week target. Uh, and it shows it by uh, specialty group. And what we're currently doing, working closely with uh, Anna and Liam, is to transfer all of those on that first line, which is the BU access team, more speedily into the service line that they are eventually going to end up with. And in actual fact, I think it's fair to say that most of those on that top line will land on the core mental health team. Uh, you said 18 months, did you mean 18 weeks? Oh, sorry, I meant 18 weeks. Sorry, oh, I was going to say, it's 18 I was in, months. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving myself a bit of leeway there. Yeah. That's weeks, right. as it says at the top, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll pause there for questions. If you don't mind, I'm recording, Miller. Um, I, I can barely hear you, actually. I'm always quiet. Um, <laughs> you say um, you, you read some dates there. That's for a first contact. <laughs> That's for a first contact. Uh, I don't have any data which relates to once the first contact has happened, how long it takes to get into treatment. That data is is not routinely collected or available from national data sources, which it is. I mean, if you look at cancer weights in the acute sector, that data is very robust and readily available. Thank you. So you'll be emailing those slides to us, will you? That yeah, 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 you're going to get all these slides, yes. Okay. Now I've got three now. I've got Chris wants to ask a question now and then Kate. Thank you, Jen. Um, Miller, do you, do you see these figures dropping now, now that we're coming to the end of the dreadful COVID um, pandemic? Um, do you think we've hit a high water mark with these figures? Gosh, I do hope so. Uh, one thing that I've been talking to Liam and Anna about is, first of all, at the high end, uh, the boxes in the red is that we should do a waiting list validation exercise to make sure that all of those patients uh, still require treatment uh, because it, over the passage of time, circumstances may have changed. Uh, so that's one thing. It also shows that by just seeing 10 patients at the, in the over 40 weeks line, we could immediately reduce the maximum weight down to 30 weeks, which would be quite an attractive proposition. So we're talking about because uh, and also these figures are inclusive of both urgent and routine patients. Uh, it, it might be in due course that we have two tables, one for routine and one for urgent. Uh, no, Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, Miller, I, in your previous slide, you say that you are getting to 70 percent of your um, of, of the numbers of, of uh, children in, the, in that uh, group of 7,000. <coughs> the remaining 30% is the reason that you're not getting to that. Is that is that due to um, a funding shortfall? Well, it's difficult to say that. I mean, for example, if you take the 1671 target for the mental health support teams in schools, in some respects, it's a perverse incentive to set the number of referrals from children to be seen by that team uh, because one would hope that referrals weren't required and, and a big part of their job is whole school activities 
designed specifically to prevent the need for referrals. So to set the target as referrals is a perverse incentive. And in fact, the national team recognised that and they're going to change change that. So in, in some respect, there's probably 10% of that, that remaining 30% is contained within the mental health support team's figure. As far as the other uh, figures are concerned, we I think we need to look very carefully to make sure that all cases are actually being re recorded. And that's what I mean by data quality is to make sure patients are not being missed. So yeah. it's very much work in progress. The 70% is the figure that is as declared at the moment, but we have to validate it. OK, thank you, Chair. So following on from that, if that, if that is the case, um, are you, is there any indication of how you, you really want to be um, describing the, the, the scale of the of the issue because it clearly if you if you're saying that these these seven thousand you're uh, you, you'd rather not be wanting to be looking at them in the in the manner in which you are what is what would be the way that you wanted to look at them because you, you know you, what you've just said is we you know we, we we're, we're getting to seventy thousand of our target but actually that isn't the target we want to be looking at. Well, I think that comes back to your chair's comment, which is that the 7,516 in a way counts widgets in the system. It's that it's counting how many attendances are there, whereas it would be far more meaningful if we could find useful outcome measures that describes the success or otherwise of the service uh, and measure that instead. Uh, an example of that is one output measure that's being uh, put into place at the moment is the number of people who have attended and have had paired, what's called paired outcome scores. In other words, you measure uh, their mental health condition at the start and you measure it again further along the line. And have you actually made a difference? Just oh, before Kate asks her question, I just want to ask what percentage of referrals are declined? And what's the reason for, for declining them? And that figure is available. Uh, I haven't got it immediately to hand, though. It, it's not a massive number. Yeah, because if you could give me a written reply to that question. Yeah. Thank you. Right, over to you, Kate. Uh, thank you. I think you might have asked, answered the question, but so is it correct that outcome measures in terms of in improving quality of life, you know, hopefully when people come into contact with services, when they leave services, they're, they're doing better. So the services currently aren't, aren't measuring whether people are doing better when they leave than when they first entered. The ambition is that is exactly what should happen. And we're improving the percentage of patients where that measurement is undertaken month by month. Yeah, so, so I mean that that sounds like a really good place to start in terms of um, in terms of your data sets. Um, yeah. uh, so um, I mean, in terms of uh, is there any kind of quality of life data collected at all, or is it just simply has the person been seen? So is that the only the only data that is collected? Uh, well, there's a whole raft of data items that are available on the minimum health. Uh, the, the mental health minimum data sets uh, and there's also a website run by NHS Futures uh, that measures all sorts of different things, some of which are for general mental health and some of them are for very specific topics like eating disorders and, uh, and autism. OK, thanks. And just, just one other question. You, you talked about not knowing um, whether once people have been seen once, they then had to go on to wait for for other services. Is that something that can be collected locally if you've got your team managers together and you know hopefully they they hold those that sort of data? Is that sounds like it's not available nationally, but is that something that that, that, that we could look at locally? Uh, there is a national figure that's given, but I've been in discussion with NHS Futures actually because I'm not <laughs> clear about the definition of the figure that they're putting forward as to exactly what it's measuring. Uh, and I, I don't want to start publishing figures that are, are, are not fully understood. But to answer directly your question, uh, we could collect uh, assessment <laughs> to treatment times 
it's a matter of whether how difficult that is and whether there is the capacity of the organization to do that extra administrative task it might be that it falls out of the use of their systems by the clinicians that uh, that data would automatically fall out I just can, can I just interject there that actually our real clinical system, which is where you'd be pulling the data from, only allows people to wait for one intervention. So if you've got a person along a pathway and they're having a number of different interventions, it's not easy on our current clinical system to be able to provide that information. It only allows people to wait for one thing the way it's currently configured. OK, just to finish off on my waiting times table, I thought you might be interested to see the impact of COVID. And that is that if you look at uh, the number of patients on the Shropshire waiting list in September 20, it was 126. And in June 21, it was 277. And broadly speaking, the organisation was keeping on top of that. But I mentioned right at the beginning that referrals have been increasing at a rate of over 25% in the year. And the figure is now 635, which is way over double what it was a year ago. So there's been a massive escalation in referrals, which has uh, in a way overwhelmed the service. And we're having to look in great detail at uh, where the next investment needs to be. Yep, Roy and, and, and Rich. Yeah, just a, a, a quick one, I thank you. Um, and these these interviews that are done or waiting that people are waiting for are they face to face or are they telephone or video? I'll let Anna answer that one. They can be a mix of all of those things, but we do listen to the family preference and obviously the acuity of the difficulty as well. So there will be some cases within there that mean that we do need to see that young person face to face. Um, but it's very much, very much a mix of, 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 of all of those um, modes of delivery of the service. Thank you. OK, Ruth. Thank you, Chair. Just on the waiting time table again, why are some people being seen in less than four weeks, 83? Um, how, how are you prioritising that? Um, you know, are those people currently waiting over 18 weeks? How, would that, how is that waiting list going to be addressed? Right, the, as I said before, this waiting list is a, is a combination of both urgent and routine cases. The urgents will always take clinical priority, which is why patients who have been on the waiting list for naught to four and five to eight weeks uh, are likely to be seen first because they are the urgent cohort. After that, it should be that we pick off patients who have waited the longest. Uh, and that's the purpose of this table. I've, this table has only been generated by myself in the last four weeks as a method of actually addressing the issue of long waiters. OK, uh, is that, uh, is that Cathy? Yes, thank you, Chair. It was just to say, particularly around the line for access, we would not normally expect to see this level of weights within access. We have had a particular issue around people leaving our access team. We're just reconfiguring the way that we're doing access. So we are moving some of the posts that were traditionally in access into core and recruited to those. So we're, you asked me when you, you were hoping to see an improvement in it. We are expecting to see an improvement on that access line within the next eight weeks. And did you just want to comment a little bit further on that? Have I covered it sufficiently? I think you've I, th I think you've covered it. it, it it's been um, interesting to see how many staff um, that we can have come into the core team to meet that and the core team have been working really hard again in terms of those urgent cases to make sure that we know who's waiting and what they're waiting for at that urgent level. Um, but we, we continue to work on that, don't we, Cathy, in terms of bringing them closer and there will be some benefits to, to doing to doing that so um, we are hopeful over the next few weeks that we will see some real changes to that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, well 
Chair, I know that I think you've got another report to consider. Uh, I the rest of my presentation is just some examples of service transformation. Uh, if you're short of time and need to move on, then this would be the point to pause what I have to say. So I'm in your hands. OK, so. Um, but you'll I get just, you'll get. I just the, want to make a few. I just want to make a few points about the main report because I have actually written about 15 sheets of paper about it. So I'm going to make. I'm just going to try and say a few things about it, and then I'm, I'm going to um, come up with a couple of ideas, and we'll see what committee thinks. Um, if you read the minutes of, of the meeting today, um, the SEN statement of action is is pretty damning actually uh, on uh, on the CCG and um, when you come to your report it's it's version 17 and the date on it is the 30th of January 21 I mean you know and, and so, some of the language I mean in two places and I, and I just want you to have a look at this on page 17 paragraph 4.9 you refer to rich information. <laughs> and then on page 636, paragraph 6.3, um, you, you say a high proportion of care, are care leavers, rich information. I mean, I just think some of the ways in which this report is written is appalling. Um, I really do. And I don't think you can refer to stuff like this as rich information. I was just quite upset about that. Um, there's a couple of things on the end here, but I just think that overall, um, if I was to make some recommendations, um, I would say that um, I will take this to Cabinet and I will say I don't accept your report. And furthermore, I would want you to come back in six months time to a joint scrutiny with performance, with some proper outcomes and performance data. So those would be my recommendations. I mean, I could talk for an hour on all the bits I've got here, but you get the general drift of it, I think, you know, it's not been working. We've got the integrated system now. We're always promised sweets tomorrow, but you know, I don't want to see this drag, but I do want to give you enough time to actually hopefully work with me, work with uh, Tanya and Sonia to, to actually come up with some performance data and bring it all back to, to a joint meeting. So would you be uh, happy about that, Miller? Or would you be willing to come? I know you'd be happy, but would you be willing to come? Well, I think it's probably Claire and Cathy to respond to that. Uh, I'm happy to come back and do a repeat performance. Uh, so, I mean, you're in charge of it all. So, you know, are you, you know, you've told us you're committed to doing all this performance performance stuff so I sorry who's got that over there? Oh right, so's Ruth. Claire. So um I would absolutely want to come back to scrutiny on a regular basis. I think for for me and a bit of the conversation that we had um quite a few months ago now about some of the send work is I mean we've struggled I mean, Miller's come in and picked this up sort of um from about February and, and had to kind of get up to speed with it. And I think going into a new organisation is helpful because we we've been working in partnership and in collaboration to a degree. And I think really now it's going to be incumbent on all of us to continue that work because actually it affects our children and young people, as you, you rightly suggest. My approach would be that we work much more closely with you as scrutiny to make sure that we're getting this right and that we're getting the the information right and that we're kind of um, we're working together on this so that there's there's where there are gaps we're identifying them so that we can address them in a really sort of constructive way and then maintain the challenge through through scrutiny so 
I'd, I'd be really, really positively support that chair so that we can just bring it back on a regular basis and maybe have discussions with elected members uh, in between time and through Tanya and Sonia to just make sure that we are keeping those connections and really understanding the problems through um, constituents. Yeah, uh, Ruth, did you want to say something there? Well, I think, uh, Chair, if I may, given the um, the waiting list that we've just seen and data, um, the action would be taking, um, be taken to um, move stuff around. I think you said you'd expect to see results within eight weeks. I would propose that we could, uh, we should um, amend our work plan so that um, this comes back in September, so that we can at least start to see any improvements. And yeah, be assured that there's improvements straight think, away. In all fairness, I think that's probably a bit soon, Ruth, because uh, you know we're coming up to August when nobody's about. And what I don't want to do is, you know, this is so important and I don't want the same old, same old. I want to actually come back where we've actually grabbed it by the neck and actually done something. So uh, I agree it needs to come back because it's urgent. But if you leave that with us, Ruth, and see if we can get this data and as soon as it's ready, we will bring it back. I promise you that. Um, I could challenge back on that. How yeah. do we know that the proposed the changes that have been made to staffing from access to core are having the desired effect on those waiting lists, which are expected to improve within eight weeks? Yeah. So, so what? Okay. So I'll split the difference with you here, Ruth, because I think you've got a point. So what we could do is we could have a well, not necessarily get anybody to come, but we could have a, a written uh, report back on that particular issue. And um, Sonia wants to, uh, sorry Sonia, I didn't see you there. Um, in terms of trying to be helpful about that, Ruth, um, I actually attend the um, performance management monitoring meetings now, so um, very helpfully with Telford and Reekin we're included. Um, so if that's not on track, I will know about that and I can have the relevant conversations. Okay. Perhaps that's helpful and a good use of everybody's time. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, Chair, thank you. I just wanted to um, specify a little bit more about the Looked After Children Challenge because I think, um, Millie, I don't think you were around at the time. Um, and I know that I've had this conversation with Cathy um, and Claire, but not necessarily Anna and um, yourself. When we were inspected by Ofsted in the middle of February, we had just short of 600 looked after children, of which 11 were open to CAMS. Um, in Shropshire and that was a real challenge for us with the inspectors and I think that we need to be very clear about and we have that figure because we did a manual count um, we weren't able to access the data we weren't able to, at that time and I think it has moved on um, and for other children who were open to CAMS outside of Shropshire so from our perspective, it was a real area of challenge to us about what we were doing about that. And so I think it would be helpful if part of what we do and those conversations that we have and Anna, obviously one of our actions is to look at those ch young children that are in, you know, um, younger children that are in residential, but it's how do we have that sort of scrutiny eye on Shropshire looked after children because 11 out of what is now 622, and I don't think it's that much higher now, um, and most of those were the autism and learning disability pathway. So in terms of mental health, as in, you know, actual kind of intervention, I think there were two at the time. So that's why it was such a significant issue for us during that inspection. So for I think we ought to give some considerations to how together we have eyes on that level of progress as well. Um, and then the second question the inspectors then asked us was, well, what's the outcome of your space for conversation, which obviously is the looked after children's workers. Um, and we had no referrals into BU through the space for conversation in the last 12 months. So you can see why from their perspective, it was an area of challenge to us. And the area and the challenge was to ourselves around, well, what are you doing about that? So I think perhaps we can scoping some time to think about how together we can work on that as well and I think that's a critical area that needs to come back. I would also ask that the best person with the most information on this topic is is asked to be a member of the looked after children's sub working group as I described before 
and then then we can address these issues. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you happy with that? Uh, Kev, you just I'll perhaps link in with Tanya on that. Sorry, I was nodding with that. Yeah, with that. <laughs> I completely agree. Who signed up for something else? Yeah, Just but... say yes. Um, Kevin. Um, again, again, I wasn't going to ask the question, but because the reception might um, drop in one, well, I think I, I, I should. Because once again, it's anecdotal, but it is about waiting lists. And I can't get my head around the sort of anecdotal evidence I have of, of parents having to wait for help. Um, I've spoken to one parent this week um, that was witnessed and she was telling me that her child's waited for over two years <coughs> for help. Um, I've had parents, spoken to parents over the years. One lady two years ago told me her seven-year-old child had waited since she was four for help. Um, and I, I know, uh, have a good relationship with uh, a lady that um, deals with pastoral care at school, and she said three and a half years uh, of wait isn't unusual. So this is why I, I'm, I'm looking at these and saying less than eight, you're saying less than eighteen weeks, when I've got these people telling me that they waited so long. <laughs> as far as autism, you, you, you did say. Um, that the NHS deal with that and diagnose it. But isn't it true that parents have to go to Chester to have that done? Um, uh, and on top of that, we've got we've got quite a, a well-known parent in this area that waited until and she tried and tried through childhood and didn't get any help till she, the children were 19. They were twins. Um, and believe it or not, I've spoken to a lady this week, her daughter didn't get help till she was 30. Yet these parents knew before the di di diagnosis, why aren't they being listened to? Okay. Um, Kate. Just, just one really uh, quick point, and, and thank you, I am a visitor to this committee, but um, uh, I just wonder whether the committee might consider putting as a priority measuring outcomes in, you know, are people doing better once they come into service? have had contact um, because I think it must be very difficult to commission a service if we don't know whether after having contact um, people are, are doing better and so um, there's millions of pounds being spent on this so I think that that might be a, a priority. Yeah and actually that was made somebody mentioned that didn't they and then they and they said they didn't know it's Kathy wasn't it she's also she said she didn't didn't know when when you when you asked her, I think it was about sort of feedback from when you, when you where you have the meetings, you know, when you help people with mental health, and you there was some question about feedback. You know, what did, what information did you get from it? I don't think I answered that, Chair. I don't know who did. Somebody else was it. Chair, can I have an answer to my question? Oh, sorry, sorry, Kevin. I don't. I don't think. I don't think there is an answer to your question. I. I think it's. We, we've got to come up with it. But uh, anyway, yeah. Is, yeah, there, yeah. is there a denial that children are waiting so long? I don't know. I don't know who's going to take that question. Can I respond to that, Chair? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, from a commissioning perspective, it's really difficult to answer on individual cases, but we. Um, we recognise that we we are letting children and parents down because of the demand both prior to the pandemic and just the increase in demand and that actually the lack of access to diagnosis for autism that's only kind of been put in place certainly in my time um, across Shropshire Health and Recon, which is about two and a half years only so it hasn't been in place that long and then adding the pandemic and the increasing uh, demand for services that you know we, we recognize that we are failing you know, some parents and children. There's also another piece of work that we have to do about um, the thresholds that we use for people to access services at both that kind of lower level support and then when they need diagnosis. And we have constant conversations with the parent and carer groups across our system about what that needs to look like and how we improve that. 
So um, it's not it's not an answer around those specific cases, but that is what we are trying to address. We are really trying to put children and young people at the heart of this now, really trying to get to grips with the impacts that this has on them and their families and really trying to look at the services that we provide, the outcomes that we get out of that. Um, and you know, we have started to do that. There was a lot of work that was done before that got sort of swallowed up by the pandemic, but we really are now starting to kind of drive some of this forward in, in, in partnership with all our colleagues across the system and the work that Miller's doing. So I, I guess it's really to recognise that and absolutely um, state that we our commitment is to work to make this better and to make sure that we're bringing additional investment and supporting workforce flows into our system to help deliver this. So it's a, it's a great place to be for our children and young people, no matter what their ability or their neurodiversity is. OK, um, I'm very conscious of time now. Cathy, did you want to just say something? Just very quickly that I completely acknowledge the long and difficult <coughs> history around autism diagnosis in Shropshire, Telford and Regan. Um, when the service transferred across to us, there were no staff associated with the autism diagnostic pathway. So as Claire mentioned, we only had the funding to recruit staff probably about 18 months, two years ago, Claire, I can't remember the exact date. So there is a history of people who waited for a very long time when there was no service there. So there is a very difficult history around this. So if you're talking about historic cases of Topi and Stand, you know, it's, it's a horrible history, but I understand why those stories are there. But we can just give you the data that we've got now at the services set up, and that's what we're presenting today. OK, so is everyone happy with the recommendation I, I made about? Yeah, everyone. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to second that proposal if that's yeah. what it was. OK, I want everyone to be happy, though, uh, with it. Is everyone everyone's happy with that? And we'll get Ruth her. Uh, I just I feel Feedback. quite strongly, Chair, that there needs to be some really clear timescales. Yeah, yeah, I agree and with I you. I think that 18 week, more than 18 week wait, some analysis and breakdown of within those 18 yeah. weeks. I mean, over 18 weeks could be 52 weeks. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, I agree. So I, I agree. And, and I, I think, think there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. But there must be some clear timescales. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, so we will work on those timescales, we'll meet up and work on those timescales and have the joint scrutiny with some with some proper targets in there, I think. Um, hopefully, uh, working together in an integrated system is going to hopefully bring improvements, but we've really got to be able to measure the outcomes and performance. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you for agreeing to work with me and um, thank you for agreeing to um, work together as well uh, and hopefully together we can actually achieve something and get some outcomes and performance targets in place. Got anything else? Uh, yeah. Yes. So, um, so thank you very much indeed. So everyone happy, everyone happy with that and I'll report to, I'll go to cabinet, the next cabinet and report back, report back to them. Yeah, yeah. so thank you very much. You, you, will you be staying for the next item or? Can we be what? released chair, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you've got more criticism in the next item as well, so. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe thank I you. should stay then. <laughs> yeah. Wait, yeah, you're on your own. You're more than welcome if you like. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank so, paper here. So, the next item on the agenda is um, Ofsted. Uh, Sonia is going to give us, I think, a little presentation, are you? Not, in, not necessarily a presentation. No, no, no. Go through a couple of things. things. OK. Um, and, and first, let me say well done. Um, and I think it speaks volumes about your staff and your team that you're actually able to achieve a good offset rating. Um, 
explain you had all this trouble with the CCG. I mean, it must have been like trying to climb a mountain with your arms and legs tied. So, you know, well done to everybody. Um, and I think Ofsted recognised that as well. So, so well done. Right, we'll let you say a few words then. Okay, thank you. I'm very conscious of time, so um, I'm going to focus more on whether there are questions really. So we've given you a brief um, report um, over seeing the Ofsted report, which obviously um, hopefully members got when it was published, but um, it was also essential that we brought it here today. Um, so the report was, um, the scrutiny report is very brief, focuses on sort of the areas where, you know, we did were quite successful, but also the areas for development that were identified during the Austin inspection. Um, and they were the right areas. So I think it's um, important I give you the assurance that none of the areas that were um, identified as needing development were new to us. They were all part of our self-evaluation. We complete a very detailed self-evaluation to submit to offset at the beginning of the inspection. Um, and they agreed with our self-evaluation in its entirety. So the key area of work obviously is the public law outline, which in your terms is the pre-court work. Um, we were pleased with the report, we were pleased with the tone of it, we were pleased with the way that the inspectors really recognised the work of the staff um, and the achievements of the staff and the families through what had obviously been a very challenging two years. Um, we do work in a, you know, challenged um, system, particularly around children and young people's mental health, but that's not to say that individual practitioners who work in that, those teams and those services don't work hard to do the best for children. And I think it's really important that we recognise that in terms of that partnership working. There is a lot of really good partnership working and work with children that when they do get a service that does go on, that doesn't minimise the sort of more strategic challenges that you've heard about today. Um, what we've also submitted to you is the um, draft now completed actually sort of summary plan, if you like, which is the one that we'll be using to communicate to staff. I've got the other one that I can show you and Dan, if you could start getting that up on the screen, that'd be great. OK, so the one that you've got, which is the sort of more pictorial brief one, is the one that we use with staff to kind of communicate what is it that we're working on? What's the direction of travel? What are our priorities? Because it's really important to me that we don't have a service that only makes improvements for offset. So what we don't do is have an offset action plan for staff. It's all incorporated into one plan and the improvements that we make are for children and families. They're not just about the inspection regime. Um, and it really shows them the um, importance of their well-being and how we support them, train them, develop them as a staff team as well as being a real sort of pillar of that improvement really. So that's the plan that came out with the um, report that you've seen. So all elements of that plan are incorporated into this, which is the one that we will be submitting with Ofsted when it's been proofread. So the reason I've not circulated this at this point in time is that obviously this is a public meeting and this isn't actually finalised or complete. As soon as we finalise this, we will circulate it to you all um, as, as members of Scrutiny. So if you could just come down a little bit for me, Daniel. So what we've done is we've formulated everything that we're working on into um, a plan. So um, this brief introduction come a bit further than that. It's kind of just will be the introduction that will be finalised when we've got um, comments. So we're very clear about what our practice priorities are within children's social care and then we update those on an annual basis and we'll be updating those as an outcome of offset and we've got a staff conference in September planned to do that so this is the ones that we're currently working towards and we try and explain how it fits in with like the Shropshire plan um, and the people's directive and priorities so we just try and put this again in one place. You can put it for me Daniel. Sorry I'm going to be saying that quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of pages as well, which is not even slides. So, so what we try to do is summarise it into, um, you know, the areas of focus that were really particularly um, um, identified by Ofsted and kind of explore those. And what you will see is as we go through this, we've already started this work. This was back in February. We had this outcome. We knew what the outcome was. We got on with it. We haven't waited around. So there's quite a lot of progress that is already green. At this point, I would say green to you, and it's not yet defined in here, is that it's in progress and on track as opposed to embedded. And I will add a blue to that rate, to rag rating to say actually done and embedded and we know is kind of business as usual. 
So um, the big area of focus is with her is this pre-court work, what we call PLO, public law outline, and we've made a significant progress in relation to that already. Um, the two items that you've got there, which is the auditing, and so we're understanding what the challenge and the problem was more, and then the implementation of the what is known as the Essex model. Essex haters calling it the Essex model <laughs> because they actually worked with five other local authorities on it, but it's become known nationally as the Essex model, so that's what we go with. Um, and so we've made good progress in relation to that. Daniel, can you come down a bit for me? Um, I'm not going to go through this item by item because obviously you will see, but I wanted you to get a sense of where we've made progress already. So we've um, completed the revision of the PLO pre-court processes in line with that model, and we've engaged staff um, in relation to the development and the rollout of that model. And we've kept that as ambient because that's kind of in process. That rollout doesn't happen overnight. You have to kind of see that improvement over time. Um, and we are working on sort of um, We've done the work around developing staff's learning and development and understanding, so training essentially of this PLO toolkit and team managers have been skilled up in relation to them being able to like work with, with the toolkit. It also requires us to work very closely with legal services and legal services have really been very supportive of us in rolling this out. Um, I'll come right the way down um, to say page eight. Um, Daniel. Um, so here we've got um, what you will see in the report is that our quality assurance is very strong and our audit framework is very strong and we're due a performance scrutiny on the 13th of July where we're going to talk a little bit more about that and how we use the data to inform our quality assurance and audit function and how we use that to inform service delivery but obviously we're very clear that was very robust, effective and impactful. So um, the quality assurance aspect of the pre-court work has um, been developed, it's in place, we're utilising that so we know whether or not we're making progress um, on a case by case basis, but also in relation to the more strategic overview around the quality of that pre-court work. Um, the um, 1.10, actually I can turn green as of yesterday because I was informed we have no waiting list now for um, family group conferences and they are happening in a really timely way. So again, it's another one that we are able to sort of say that we can utilise. Um, the area of challenge for us, um, if we come down to the bottom of page nine, is um, the area of, so when we develop this plan, apologies, when we develop this plan, we don't just do where we've got clear recommendations. We look through the report, we look through the feedback that we got on a day-by-day -day basis in the inspection and say, we're also identified that we could make improvements or we needed to think about it. So um, the report, as you can see, is quite brief, considering it was a quite significant um, inspection. So we get a lot of what we call soft intelligence feedback. So the, so the information we got behind the placement sufficiency sort of recommendation we've utilised in this plan and kind of expanded on it. Um, so placement sufficiency for children who do become looked after is a real challenge for us in Shropshire for two reasons. One is obviously we've got more children becoming looked after in a range of settings, um, but also that there just isn't the provision nationally, and particularly for the more complex children and more risky children. So we're, that's why we're looking to sort of further develop stepping stones so that we can really work with families to try and keep those children back at home. And that's sort of the real sort of outcome that we're working towards. Um, if I come down further, um, the issue of tracking permanence. So permanence is when you have a very clear plan to make sure that a child has a permanent home, wherever that may be. Um, so we have to really track that from the moment that we get involved with children and they're at risk of becoming looked after and start looking at all of those options and which one is going to be in the best child's best interest. Um, and where we're putting a lot of time and effort and we've got some, had some additional investment this year is where children have family or extended family that they can live with and be supported by because actually their outcomes are much better for them. So that's what the 2.4 it relates to and so we've done a lot of work on that in the last few months. Um, you've heard a lot about partnership response to emotional health needs of children in care. 
it is an area of challenge for us. There is no doubt about that. As I say, we do see children who have good services and make good progress, but it's not all of our children by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and we're, we're really working to see how we can work alongside our colleagues in the most effective way to both challenge and support and to be part of the solution. And I think that's really important for us. Um, and it's certainly very important for, you know, Ofsted. What they don't want is to see us at lobbyists <coughs> with our partners. They want to see us as being as leaders, as being part of the solution. Um, the area of need and, and, and concern for me, as you heard, um, is the children who are young and in residential care and we need to work with our partners to find some real solutions for them. So during COVID we had about eight children under the age of 10 come into residential care. That's not something to be proud of in Shropshire really. Um, and it is a system issue, you know, there's no doubt about that, but it's greatly impacted on by how quickly those services that you've picked up on today are accessed. You know, if you've got a really challenging eight year old with very complex autism and they have to wait six months to be seen, that family, particularly during COVID, has used all their energy and ability to kind of cope up in that period of time and they end up in residential care. So we do need to look for some of those alternative solutions. Um, coming down, obviously, the big area for us is staff wellness and recognising our staff's contributions. So we had a fantastic um, staff awards ceremony last month. Um, was it April, May? I've slept. Um, and um, I'm very grateful Kirsty and Leslie attended along with Ed. Um, and it was a really positive event and staff were really recognised for the, the success of their um, work. They were nominated for awards by their colleagues, so there wasn't any sort of like management awards, etc. It was very much colleagues nominating colleagues for work they'd done that they'd admired and respected. And we had over 230 people present receiving awards. Um, so we've done a lot of work around recognising that that contribution and um, I always feed back to staff when um, whether it be scrutiny or cabinet have recognised their work and you know we put that in the three minute brief so your support is appreciated. Um, there's a number of other areas that we are working with sort of for example our colleagues in EDT and our colleagues in um, early help to kind of address some of those challenges um, and one of the big areas for us is face-to-face -face supervision because obviously a lot of that work went behind a screen during COVID as part of the safety measures, etc. We really want to work with our staff and managers to get back into ensuring that supervision, particularly child and family related supervision, is face to face so that we've got that relationship based conversations about the complexity of the casework. Um, if any of you have had the opportunity to read the, the National Review on Arthur and Star, there's a real focus on that, that, that level of supervision and that level of case discussion is so important, particularly in the child protection arena. Um, I don't want to continue to go through it, but hopefully you'll see, and I will make sure this is circulated as soon as we've finalised, it's got to be lost there by Monday, so um, we've made a lot of progress already against the um, recommendations, <coughs> and I'm really happy to take questions because I'm clear that you're short of time. Right. It's, it's, uh, what I was going to say, Sonia, was that um, the, the bit um, number 19, I think, in the summary bit, uh, where um, Ofsted talked about CCG, I mean, that's that what we decided earlier is got to be really positive for all this, hasn't it? You know, um, because actually you did a really good job, your staff did a really good job. The two, the two areas really where you were let down a bit is the police, which is hopefully sorted now, we said, uh, and also the CCG. And hopefully with the joint commissioning and hopefully with the commitment to work together, we're going to be able to sort those things out and it's going to be a good thing because it makes life easier for your staff and anything that makes it easier for your staff got to make it better for the kids absolutely so um i think it's really important that um scrutiny has eyes on this topic yeah because when officer come back they will say so what is your leaders yeah and, and that they mean the widest sort of leadership done to address the issue so i think it's a um i'm very grateful to support scrutiny yeah okay Thank you very much indeed. Has anybody got anything else? Just, I mean, I'd just like to recommend that we pass on thanks to all the staff. Not really anything I 
recommendation. Will help you with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and thank you very much indeed. Um, both to Tanya and Sonia, I know how stressful it was. Um, and you did an amazing job, so well done. Right, so I think the next thing here is the work programme. Now, originally, we were going to have a, a, a meeting with the whole committee yesterday, but it was um, planning, uh, so we cancelled the meeting. So I think, considering Peggy's not here, that probably what we ought to do is rearrange a, a little bit of the team's meeting and, and sort it out when Peggy's back. Peggy's not on screen at the moment, but I'm sure that would be the best solution. Is everyone yeah. happy with that? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I mean, it's, we've, um, we've already totally agree with that. We've already uh, started to make arrangements with that. Yeah. Our, our senior management team are very busy people and trying to find a, a slot where we can all meet together is proving right. quite, it's quite a challenge. So what I've done here is I've put in a holding work program, right, okay. uh, which is available obviously, obviously it's only in draft form at the moment, yeah. but uh, it looks very likely that we'll have to delay any planning meeting until August, okay. uh, which is obviously leaves it very little time then to start preparing some of these items. Yeah. So I, I, I've, I've written this for you as bringing in some of the priorities that, that you've uh, raised with us, Chair, and, and the, the, the Chair has raised with us and the, and the Executive Director's so, so what have you got now for Wednesday? What have you got for the next meeting Wednesday? I think when we met, I think the, the, the big priority that the Chair really wanted to bring back was, was, was criminal exploitation, particularly in light of the large number of children that would be coming looked after. Um, we looked at this about two years ago and I think uh, the Chair was very keen to get some sort of updates in terms of how that's actually embedded. It was a very new system at the time that it came to scrutiny at the end. Um, she sort of feels that it really ought to sort of come back to the room new. Okay. So everyone content with that? Yeah. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. I might get this one, Daniel, I don't know. But it worries me that um, often, quite often we ask for task and finish and that sort of thing, and Daniel yeah. finds it very hard to fit these in, <coughs> and on top of the sort of stuff he does anyway, yeah. he even talks faster, so you can say <laughs> But um, I, 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 I find it hard to believe that a, 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 a council this size can't employ somebody else to assist in the police, because if we're not having these these um, task and finish groups, then then things may go awry, you know, uh, and they need to be scrutinised. And, and I, I think he's, he's just got too much on. I think I think there is some help with the yeah. HOSC, isn't there? Yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. really really happy to announce actually that yeah. uh, that we we uh, that, that, that Tom does is, is taking on joint health and health, yeah. which is which is fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a big topic. It needs a it needs it needs an office to focus on it entirely. It's a huge. Three up seventy five percent of his time. Uh, that, that's 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 <laughs> So I'm delighted to be off the treadmill of preparing for the next meeting to actually have some time to sort of do some substantive work on a topic to bring to you. So, so hopefully okay. yeah, we'll see some changes going forward. OK, right. Thank you very much well, indeed. Well, All right, then. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Little live at the moment, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. You should tell us when it's off then.